Early 1960s. The world is on edge. The Cuban Missile Crisis. The arms race. The looming threat of nuclear war. The US and the USSR are on the brink of direct conflict. And even the smallest piece of intelligence could shift the balance in a global standoff. Since 1956, the US has been relying on the U-2 reconnaissance aircraft. It flew at over 21 kilometers in altitude, safely above the reach of most surface-to-air missiles. But on May 1, 1960, a Soviet S-75 missile shot down a U-2 over Sverdlovsk. The pilot, Francis Gary Powers, survived and was captured, revealing the covert surveillance operations conducted by the United States over the USSR to the entire world. It triggered an international crisis. That moment made one thing clear. The age of slow, high-flying spy planes was over. The Pentagon needed a whole new breed of aircraft, one that was faster, untouchable, and nearly invisible. A plane that could penetrate enemy airspace and be gone before anyone could react. And so, in 1961, the CIA launched a top-secret program, A-12 Oxcart, the predecessor of what would become the SR-71. The task fell to Skunk Works, the Advanced Development Division at Lockheed, led by legendary engineer Clarence Kelly Johnson. Even then, they were dreaming big. Build a machine that could fly faster than Mach 3, climb higher than 25 kilometers, and be immune to enemy defenses. At the time, every flight over Soviet territory was a gamble with death. Recon data would go out of date in hours. Satellites couldn't yet match the flexibility or resolution needed to replace manned missions. America needed an answer, and it had to be revolutionary. That's how the journey began toward the SR-71, a plane designed not just to fly, but to challenge the very laws of physics and win. In 1962, following the successful test flights of the A-12, the project reached a new stage. The CIA handed over its developments to the US Air Force and work began on an improved version, SR-71. The letters SR stood for Strategic Reconnaissance. At the helm remained Kelly Johnson, the man behind the U-2 and many other groundbreaking aircraft. But even for him, the SR-71 was a formidable challenge. A speed of over Mach 3, altitudes beyond 25 kilometers, and flights in conditions where metals could melt and regular engines would burn out, all while aiming for stealth, maneuverability, and near total invulnerability. To survive the heat generated at supersonic speeds, the airframe couldn't be made of aluminum. It had to be titanium, a light, strong, and heat-resistant metal. But there was one major obstacle. Over 85% of the world's titanium was mined in the USSR. So the Americans went through shell companies, registered in third countries, and began quietly purchasing titanium from their main adversary, right under the KGB's nose. Back then, the US had virtually no experience working with titanium. It was rigid, brittle, sensitive to chlorine, and extremely difficult to weld. Everything had to be developed from scratch. Specialized tools, cooling systems, welding techniques, fasteners, and sealing methods. The work was carried out under intense secrecy. Engineers had their notebooks confiscated. Workshops were guarded by military personnel, and blueprints were locked away in safes. Even the name Blackbird didn't appear right away. At first, the aircraft was known as the RS-71 until President Lyndon Johnson, during an official announcement, misspoke and called it the SR-71. The name was quickly changed to match the slip-up, so it would seem intentional. On December 22, 1964, the first SR-71 took to the skies. By 1966, serial production had begun. And from the very first flight, it was clear, this wasn't just an aircraft. This was a machine that was at least 30 years ahead of its time. A plane with no equal in any military fleet in the world. Thus, from the secret labs of Lockheed emerged a jet black silhouette, swift as lightning and elusive as a shadow. 
The SR-71 wasn't just fast, it was engineered as if the laws of physics were optional. Over 92% of its structure was made from titanium, making it the first aircraft in history to be built on such a scale from this material. At speeds above Mach 3, the skin of the plane could reach 600 degrees Celsius, which would destroy ordinary metals. But titanium didn't just survive, it functioned, expanding with the heat and sealing gaps in the structure. Paradoxically, on the ground, the SR-71 wasn't airtight. Its fuel tanks leaked. Inside, the aircraft had nine main tanks, and the joints between them were intentionally designed with gaps, so that in flight, under heat expansion, they would seal perfectly. This clever engineering is what led to the myth that the SR-71 leaked fuel. In reality, the leaks were a feature, not a flaw. The Pratt & Whitney J-58 engines were unique. They were the only serially produced jet engines in history capable of operating in afterburner mode for extended periods. Moreover, at speeds above Mach 2.2, they transitioned into a pseudo-ramjet mode, functioning almost like hypersonic engines. This increased thrust and reduced internal temperature. The SR-71 used JP-7 fuel, which is extremely resistant to ignition. It was so stable that it required a special chemical igniter triethyl borane to launch it. This substance ignited instantly upon contact with air and was used to light the engines. The SR-71 had a unique shape, a long fuselage, sharp wing edges, and complex air inlets to manage airflow into the engines. These weren't just for aerodynamics, they were essential for managing the shockwave that, at supersonic speeds, literally pushed the aircraft forward. Even its paint was special black, with heat-dispersing particles. That's where the Blackbird nickname came from. But this wasn't just poetic. The surface coating also absorbed radio waves, reducing its visibility. Combined with its altitude and speed, the SR-71 was virtually invisible to the air defenses of its time. It's hard to believe, but all of these solutions were developed in the early 1960s, without computers, using barely any digital calculations. Everything was done on paper, with slide rules and analog tools. When the SR-71 took to the skies, it didn't just fly, it pushed the limits of what was even considered possible. Its top speed reached 3,529 kilometers an hour, or Mach 3.3. The altitude? Nearly 26 kilometers. That's not just above the troposphere. It's the edge of the stratosphere where the air is so thin, it barely qualifies as air anymore. At such speeds, the leading edge of the wing would heat up to 400 degrees centigrade. In some parts of the fuselage, the temperature reached 650 degrees centigrade, while the average across the entire airframe hovered around 260 centigrade. The SR-71 didn't just soar through the sky. It was, quite literally, burning through it. And yet, it kept flying. Pilots operated in conditions bordering on outer space. They wore full pressure suits nearly identical to those used by astronauts. The cabin was engineered to withstand drastic pressure changes in extreme heat, while supplying breathable oxygen at high altitudes. Mistakes weren't an option. At those heights and speeds, there was no margin for error. A minor course deviation, a tiny malfunction, and you would lose control, tear apart the fuselage, or burn up. Flying the SR-71 wasn't just a mission, it was walking a razor's edge. But even if the enemy managed to detect it, bringing the SR-71 down was virtually impossible. Surface-to-air missiles couldn't reach it in time. They simply weren't fast enough. The only hope was to land a direct hit along a predictive trajectory. And even then, there was only a 20-second window before the aircraft sped out of range. One of the SR-71's typical flight paths, nicknamed the Baltic Express, began in the UK. From there, it flew over Denmark, passed through international airspace near the Uland Islands, skimmed along the Soviet coast, and returned, all of it in mere minutes, without violating a single sovereign border. The SR-71 didn't become a legend for breaking a single record. It became a legend because nothing could catch it. No nation, no missile, no aircraft. On July 28, 1976, 
the SR-71 set two official world records that still stand today. Speed, 3,529.56 kilometers an hour. At an altitude of 24.4 kilometers, that's Mach 3.3 and a sustained horizontal flight at 29,929 meters. For comparison, commercial airliners cruise at about 10 kilometers, at speeds up to 900 kilometers an hour. At such altitudes, the sky appears black even at noon, and the curvature of the Earth is clearly visible. SR-71 crews saw the planet the way only astronauts usually do. At Mach 3.3, the crew could witness three sunrises and three sunsets in a single hour. The aircraft quite literally sliced through time and space. It was already back at base before enemy analysts even understood what had happened. The Pratt & Whitney J-58 engines remain the only jet engine in aviation history that could transition into ramjet mode above Mach 2.2. This allowed the SR-71 not just to maintain speed at high altitudes, but to accelerate while other aircraft were already losing thrust. Every attempt to build something faster, Aurora, X-43, HTV-2, SR-72, either remained in prototype form or failed to achieve operational stability. During an hour of flight, the crew saw three sunrises and three sunsets. At 3,500 kilometers an hour, the SR-71 effectively outran and overtook the sun, letting its pilots witness day and night cycle multiple times in a single mission. But numbers are not everything. The heart of the legend lies in its real-world missions and stories. Vietnam War, 1960s. The SR-71 conducted dozens of flights over the territory of North Vietnam. More than 800 surface-to-air missiles were launched at it, not a single one hit. Not a single aircraft was ever shot down by enemy fire in the entire history of the service. 1973, the Arab-Israeli Yom Kippur War. The Blackbird flew recon missions over Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. On October 13th, an SR-71 spotted Egyptian troop movements and warned Allied forces about a planned attack the following day. Israel had time to regroup and repel the assault. That's the kind of intelligence that can change the course of a war. Only 32 SR-71s were ever built. Of those, 11 were lost. Not in combat, but due to technical malfunctions or failures at extreme speeds. Only one pilot died throughout the aircraft's entire operational history. Jim Zweier. His death occurred in 1966 when the aircraft was destroyed in the air. The SR-71 was turning at a speed above Mach 3.17. There was a flow failure, and the car fell apart. The second crew member, pilot Bill Weaver, survived. He blacked out and regained consciousness while falling. His parachute deployed automatically. Only 150 people were ever qualified to fly the SR-71. Piloting it was more demanding than flying a space shuttle. All pilots underwent many years of training, including high-altitude spacesuits, centrifuges, ejection, and overload training. To fly the Blackbird wasn't just a job. It was the aerospace equivalent of becoming a cosmonaut. The SR-71 was nothing short of incredible, but also incredibly expensive. Just keeping a single aircraft operational cost the U.S. around $300 million per year. That covered everything – crew training, refueling with the rare JP-7 fuel, maintenance of its highly complex engines, and support for the unique infrastructure that kept it flying. But in the end, cost wasn't what grounded it. By the 1980s, spy satellites and unmanned aerial vehicles were evolving rapidly. They were cheaper to operate, could stay airborne longer, and didn't put human lives at risk. What's more, the military was shifting toward real-time tactical intelligence rather than strategic information delivered days later, after the SR-71 had returned to base and the film had been developed. Satellites could transmit images almost instantly. The U-2 was upgraded with digital communication systems, but the SR-71 remained anchored in its analog world. The first official retirement came in 1990. But after pressure from Congress and the emergence of new operational needs, a few Blackbirds were brought back in 1995. Still, the final decision came during President Bill Clinton's administration. 
In 1998, the SR-71 was permanently retired. The irony? Even after being grounded, the SR-71 was never truly replaced. Satellite orbits are predictable. Adversaries can hide what they don't want seen, but the appearance of a Blackbird couldn't be anticipated. According to military officials, even three decades after its maiden flight, the SR-71 remained the fastest, most unpredictable reconnaissance platform in the world. The Blackbird was not just an aircraft, it became a symbol of engineering audacity, a monument to a time when humanity still looked at the sky and asked, what if? Even in the 2020s, as we build hypersonic planes and classified drones, the SR-71 remains the benchmark. Every new design is still measured against it, and so far, none have surpassed it. The SR-71 Blackbird may be gone, but its legacy is everywhere. In the design of modern fighter jets, in satellite reconnaissance, in hypersonic programs, and in the imagination of young engineers. Time will tell if something like it will ever be built again, or if the SR-71 will forever remain the legend humanity once dared to create. So we may be seeing here the highest speed uh, military airplane that there will be around for a long time. 